Hello, and welcome to the heart of Fiat Crucified Love. This week, we're going to talk about my books. I'm going to go through each of the six books that I have written and published and kind of show how they're connected to each other and tell you a little bit about what each, each one is about and how they've really affected different lives in different places, right? So I'll spend a couple minutes on each of the books and then we'll be through the whole thing. At the beginning, I had this song on my heart to sing with you. Um, and I do better picking it than I do strumming it, although it's usually strummed. So we'll see what we can do. Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us a fire of thy love. Send forth your Spirit, and we will be recreated, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. and shine your light on us and shine your light through us. We ask that we may become radiant flames of your divine love. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit 
as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Okay, we're cozied up in this corner. I just thought my roses looked good with Joseph this morning because they're both blue and bright and Mary matches those and the knees match those and Our Lady of Fatima I pulled out because she's part of some of these books. And I thought, I'm just going to do it here, right? This is a great conglomeration of Mary Klaska's heart and life. And that's what I want to share with you this week, especially in these books. And each one of them has an icon of mine on the front. And it's interesting because um, I learned when I was in Russia, I worked closely with the Claritian priests. And part of their charism is to spread the gospel through every form of media. So like they would do a lot of writing, but they would do radio, they did like theater with the kids and just all sorts of creative things. And I really got to be close spiritual friends with St. Anthony Maria Claret. I actually have a relic of his over there. And um, I liked his teaching about um, being placed in the fire to be conformed to Christ and then to spread that fire in the world. And so it's interesting because I see how the Lord is doing that like suddenly in my life, right? So from 2011 through 2018, I lived as a hermit. I lived extreme silence and solitude, prayer and fasting, poverty, chastity, and obedience. And before that, I was a missionary. And when I got thrown back into the world, um, God somehow, instead of replacing those two aspects of my life, deepened them. He made me even more of a hermit. So for example, this morning when I got up, I was just overwhelmed with a lot of intentions and different things that the Lord needs to arrange in the world. And um, I, I, I was going to go to a mass with my dad. I, he invited me late last night. I said, I'll see. And I thought, I cannot be around people right now. Like, I just need Jesus. So I ended up spending my morning from about, I think my alarm went off at 545 until I did the rosary at like 11 or 1115, just in prayer, silent prayer. And um, it is the istochnik, um, they say in Russian, the spring, the source of all that I am. Is that kind of intense prayer in silence, in solitude, in stillness with the Lord. But um, so it's interesting that as I get thrown back into the world, that doesn't leave me. It's just that I live it. I have to change around my schedule a little bit, little bit because as a nanny, then I also need to go and take care of children and, you know, be with them. Um, but then the missionary aspect of my life also didn't end. And God began to explode um, his gifts to the world through me in ways even greater than the years that I traveled to all of these countries. And I think a lot of ways that was preparation so that I could touch them most profoundly now through the things that I do. But I had spent, you know, years in Siberia and Russia and Africa and Poland and all over Asia and Europe and I you know had been down to Mexico and um, I, I got to know the people I got to know their language I got to know different cultures I got to know their sufferings um, and I prayed among them and then I began as I um, went back out into the world all at once the Lord um, had me start kind of mission work from here in the United States and um, it came through, at the beginning, books, right? So I had written a couple books over the years I had never had published, but then I continued to write more. So in 18 months, I published six different books. And we're going to go through them. And at the same time, over the last 20-some years, I never took an art class, but um, I had a priest who would often give me the penance of painting icons, and the Holy Spirit really taught me to paint. You can see that... Um, the style that I paint with is not the traditional, like, Russian or Greek icons, right? It's different. It's almost more like the Polish folk art, right? Or the Indians, you know, people have said they've seen that in there. 
Um, but there's very deep meaning to the art that I paint and it, it spreads a message just in and of itself. And so in fact, some people who have interviewed me on my books have said that it's the art on the front and in the, in the inside that speaks and attracts and affects people more than actually the words. But then there's also the teaching and then um, there's music. So, you know, I obviously, you can tell from that song, I'm no professional and I don't have time to practice. <laughs> But um, I love the Lord and I'm able to share a song every once in a while. I've written some music that's very beautiful and recorded it well, right? Um, but I, I offer the, the world that same message of the Lord's, um, his gift to me of the spirituality of being his little wife crucified, right? Of littleness, spousal love, and the cross that I have lived um, really ever since Notre Dame. So for many years, and it's taken different, um, different, like you can live it in different ways depending on your state of life, right? So when I'm in the world, it looks a little different. When I'm in a hermitage, it looks different. If I was married, it would look different. Um, the children that I share it with, it's different. Um, a priest trying to live that way, that littleness, spousal love in the cross with Christ would look differently than um, the way that I live it. but. It's that basic spirituality that I um, want to teach to the world. And um, God never gives us gifts just for ourselves. He gives us gifts to share with others, right? So to leave that imprint of his, um, his little, humble, spousal, crucified love on the hearts that I meet. So I've done that through the books and I've done it through the art, through the music. And then like here we sit at a podcast and a radio program and, and speaking. And that's also another gift. And sometimes I do it like this on the internet. Sometimes I give a talk at a church and, you know, rarely anymore, but sometimes I do do retreats yet. Right. And um, it's all different ways, like St. Anthony Maria Claret would have um, loved. It's different ways of sharing that same message. And then in my daily life, my ordinary life of cooking and cleaning and taking care of my parents and taking care of the kids I take care of, um, I also try to constantly live littleness, spouse the love of Jesus, and embracing of the cross. Um, so that it's something that's incarnate, that's not just in words or in images or in music or spoken, but it's something that's lived right? Because I think that people are affected most by um, our lives themselves and how we, you know, regulate ourselves and the virtue that we live affects the rest of the church. You know, Christ is the head of the one body of Christ and we're all a different part. So if I can practice the patience that I preach Christ had on the cross, or if I can practice faithfulness like Joseph was, or purity like Our Lady, or humility like Jesus himself, you know, then I am affecting the body of Christ. Even if you never see me, you never read my work, you never see my art, you never know who I am. I'm still changing your life. Um, because what we do affects other people the same way that if I sin, that's hurting you even if you don't know me or don't know the sin. Even when I practice virtue and I try to live this union with Christ and it affects you, right? And I see how deeply it's come to really affect the world. And I'll be honest with you. Um, it, it's shared with the world in a way that keeps me very blind. You know, I can put up pictures of what, you know, people holding my books or, you know, share with you quotes of their testimonies about how it's changed their lives or things like that. And I do that for two reasons. I share that one because I've asked your donations and I want to show you the fruit of your sacrifice. And the second is to inspire you. You know, if, if these books have changed the lives of so many people all over the world, then maybe you should get them and you should read them. You should share them with people here at home. So that's why I share it with you. But even when I share it, God keeps me blind to 
really what he's doing through me. Like, I feel like I'm very distant from it and I don't understand. But um, it's beautiful because in that I can just be this transparent um, funnel of grace for his love for the world. And I don't necessarily have to see, understand, or even control it, right? I do what I can. I write what I can. I paint what I can. I speak what I can. I sing what I can, right? And I put it together and I raise the funds that I can because in my in myself, I am very poor. I don't have money to do all of this. Um, and then I send it. I sacrifice countless hours to get this out there. And then it's in the hands of the Holy Spirit to touch the hearts of people and to change them and to inspire them to take these seeds and to do great things. And people are doing great things with the gifts of these books. So they're from me, but they're not really from me. They're from God. They're through me. And there's six books that I, um, that I published last year. And the first couple are in Spanish and Polish and Urdu. And unfortunately, I've had a hard time raising funds and finding help to spread the Spanish and the Polish. Um, but I'm confident that it will be done eventually because the Lord brought me good and holy um, translators who did a phenomenal job. And that was not for naught, right? It's just his time. But the first book is The Holiness of Womanhood. And... Um, it's really beautiful, this icon. It was kind of miraculous. I went to paint an icon of the infant Mary and I did it wrong. When I did her face, I thought that's not an infant. And I thought to myself, well, I don't need another image of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, but I'm just gonna paint it. And I put it in my room that night and as I was falling asleep and my eyes were closed, I saw light and I opened and it was glowing from um, the corner of my room. And I thought, wow, that must be important. Well, the next day as we were working on the publishing of this book, I had had a different picture for the front, but I wrote my publisher and I said, um, you can't actually use that picture because it, I don't know who painted it. I can't give credit to them. And it's like something I grabbed from the internet just to kind of fill that space. And he said, well, what about one of your icons? And our Lord pointed to this. And it's really beautiful because this icon of Our Lady and her immaculate heart, her shining, the holiness of her womanhood has attracted so many souls to this book, even above and beyond the subject. Um, there was a story of it being in the Muslim north of Nigeria and somebody was transporting it to share with a group of people and they were in the market and a little girl in the market who was 14 was selling bread. And she came up and she said, what is that picture? And she was attracted to Our Lady and she was Muslim. And she said, can I have that book? And he said, sure. And she said, my parents, you know, they're not literate, but I'm gonna read this to them. So it was the image that drew her to the message inside. But this book, The Holiness of Womanhood, is something that I, um, I originally thought about when I was back at the university in the late 90s. And I ran up against a lot of really bad feminists who um, stomped on the beauty and the dignity and the uh, um, holiness of how God created us to be women and why. And they had a kind of a grudge against Our Lady and her humility. They would mock it. And... Um, it made me very sad and I started to study what the church taught about the vocation of womanhood. And I read, you know, Mulieris Dignitatum by John Paul II and um, Edith Stein and uh, Fulton Sheen and all sorts of different people, some modern day writers who um, had, you know, written about true holiness of womanhood. It was way before, like now you could find 500 different, you know, people speaking on that topic. But back then in the late 90s, there weren't, um, there were just a handful of ladies and it was not something developed. So I um, really studied this and I wrote a long paper for one of my classes on this topic. And 
um, Professor Ralph McInerney, who was my professor, he asked if he could publish it and he asked if he could keep it. And he said, this, um, you really should work on this in the church. I think that you have a gift. And later on, I went on to um, give some retreats in Russia and in Poland and the United States, kind of based from that book and then other prayerful reflections. And as I studied theology of the body, I threw that in and studying scripture, I added more things and voila, I had a book. And, um, you know, I sent it off to a couple places and they said, well, you're not famous enough to publish. We only publish famous people. And unfortunately, even in the Catholic world, there's kind of a popularity contest and a dog eats dog kind of attitude um, with big Catholic publishers. And um, rarely do they look at the heart of what the Holy Spirit's doing. And um, I had a good author friend, Rhonda Shervin, who kept encouraging me. She said, no, this is brilliant. This needs to be out there. And she sent me to her publisher, who is a small publisher. He's my publisher. It's in route media and books. And um, he said, absolutely. So um, we published this. And it's interesting because right away I was contacted by a man in Pakistan. And he asked if he could translate it into Urdu. And I said, sure, you know, kind of go through any door that opens. And there was a man in Egypt that wanted to translate it into Arabic. And he then, after um, starting the project with me, kind of cut me off. And I just, I never heard from him again. I don't know what happened to him. Um, and I had some people in Kenya and in Uganda, in Malawi, all ask if they could translate it. And I said, sure. And um, a lot of these people fell away. They either didn't do it or they didn't share it with me. They did it and shared it with their people and didn't get it published, at least under my permission. And that's fine, as long as it's preaching the gospel, right? But um, in Pakistan, it really, it kind of exploded. And I was able to raise some money to print so that we could, um, he originally tried to sell them at cost, so we had money to print more. But he saw the need of those who are most abused in their womanhood did not have any money. And some of them weren't even literate. Somebody needed to read to them um, about the dignity of their womanhood. So we've been able to print several thousand copies of this in Pakistan. We need more. Um, and it's just transformed the Middle East. And it, it was then snuck into Afghanistan in the Dari language. And um, then in Nigeria, somebody contacted me and we're able to distribute thousands of copies there. And it's in these places where Christians are persecuted, but women are, are beaten, they're raped, they're abused. And I started to get stories from these front lines about how this book um, healed the wounds of their heart and strengthen them. They, as so many said, the first time in my life, I don't regret not being a man. The first time in my life, I see something beautiful about who I am as a woman. Um, and this book is just, you know, for every one book given, hundreds of souls are touched. They'll read it out loud at parishes and at, you know, Protestant congregations and funerals sometimes of you know, a woman that's killed or something. And um, it's really incredible what it's done. I also was able to share it with some bishops in our country and um, the seminaries, because I think that our country is hungry for this. There's a lot of fluffy books on women's spirituality, but this gets to the heart of it and draws you deep into the heart of Our Lady through authentic Catholic teaching, but through a spirituality and the Holy Spirit in a way that Nothing else really out there does. Um, I was touched when Father Mitch Pacwa um, wrote my, uh, my endorsement here. He said, Mary Klaska takes on an important though much neglected issue, the real difference between women and men with a focus on the impact of those differences on women's spirituality. The joy of reading this is that in place of the anger that sometimes accompanies such issues, Mary gently and calmly observes the differences and celebrates both, even as she focuses her attention on the spiritual gifts of women. Her book is a profound aid in women's spiritual development. And that's a shortened version. The longer version of his endorsement, he said, um, 
here. I, a man, have directed women, and I know a number of women who give spiritual direction to men, yet Mary's insights into the spiritual life of women offer far more insight than I can. In addition, her experience comes from her having lived on four continents among very diverse people, North America, Europe, Africa, and Asia, which gives her insights breadth. Her own spiritual life is the obvious source of her depth. Her book is a profound aid in the women's spiritual development. So, you know, even Father Mitch Pacwa said that he saw something, you know, same thing Dr. Rhonda Shervin, she said that she had written books on women's spirituality and even she learned from this. So it's a very powerful, beautiful thing. You can read it in a book, in a group, you know, as like a, a book club or something, you could use it as a retreat. I've given retreats on it. Or you could just read it at home. Um, but it has touched rich people and poor people, theologians and the uneducated. Um, you know, every culture, every age, old people and young people. Um, it's It really just is one of those classic books. And so we're hoping and praying that we can raise enough money to get it into Mexico, Belize, Colombia, Puerto Rico, and then continue on south. The um, Spanish translation is beautifully done. Um, so I ask you to pray for the funding that we need for that um, and that we find an outlet for it in Poland because we also have a good Polish translation. Um, since my first retreat on the topic was in Russia, I have a desire to get it into Russia too someday. So it's the holiness of womanhood. All of these books can be found on Amazon and many of them can be found like in Barnes and Noble and Walmart and Target and all of that as well. So the second book that we then published is Out of the Darkness. And this is one too that I had kind of written years before. Um, the beginning of it, I the, it's kind of in two parts. I had written um, during a time of great solitude and prayer in the middle of Siberia. I lived alone with the Blessed Sacrament and I couldn't really leave my apartment. And um, the Lord really spoke to me. And the title, Out of the Darkness, this is also an icon of mine that I painted in Siberia, actually. But the title comes from the book of Sirach. And um, I was going to read it exactly. His judgment is sound who fears the Lord. Out of darkness, out of obscurity, he draws forth a clear plan. And the whole book is on the interior suffering of Christ. And then the second part is like personal reflections from Jesus to a soul um, about his way of the cross. And it starts with the Last Supper and it goes all the way through the resurrection. Um, but this book too has been translated into both Spanish and Polish, so I'd like to get that out to people. And um, Urdu in Pakistan and in Dari, and there's a thousand copies in Afghanistan now among the persecuted Christians. And this book has also, just like the holiness of womanhood, touched very deeply the Middle East, North Africa, and places where um, persecution has rung out. And it's spoken to their hearts because they live in the darkness. They live the midst of the martyrdom of the cross. Um, the people that they know and love are constantly martyred um, and tortured and their faith is suppressed. They're in a prison in a way. And they have found healing, strength and courage, hope, light and peace through everything written in here. And it's a perspective that comes from the heart of Jesus himself. Um, and so because of that, it touches each individual heart in a different way. You know, as I'm reading the testimonies from the Middle East and these persecuted people, um, and this book has been the impetus of the conversion of many Muslims. Um, this and the holiness of womanhood. It's being taught in Muslim colleges and read at mosques and it's drawing, Jesus Christ crucified is drawing them into the Catholic Church. And um, it's beautiful when I read these testimonies that are sent to me because I think, wow, 
Here, I wrote this for myself privately, never intending to publish it when I was in the middle of Russia. But when I read it in light of their situation today, you know, when you see those images of what was going on in Afghanistan with the Taliban, and then you read this, um, it seems as if God had this book written just for them, right? Just for their people, for their time. And, you know, with people in quarantine in the United States and COVID and everything shut down, this really came out at a beautiful time because people felt imprisoned and in a great darkness, a hopelessness, a fear. And none of that is from God at all. Um, and so this was a great light, a door that could kind of open them through the crucified heart of Jesus into heaven and could give um, that heavenly perspective on things to those who encountered it. So uh, this, it, there is a great need for this book and I really hope that we can, after finishing the funds to print The Holiness of Womanhood, La Santidad de la Mujer in, Poland, in Spanish, I hope that we can raise several thousand dollars to print this book as well, um, Out of the Darkness in Spanish for the people who also live in um, the missions in Central America are dark. And there is a lot of um, persecution, people who leave the faith and troubles that come through just poverty and the drug cartel and corrupt governments and things. And so this is a book that can be a crutch to their broken hearts. Um, so I ask for you to pray for the um, the spread of this as well. And if you haven't read it, it would be an awesome Lenten reading for you. I really encourage you to get it for this upcoming Lent and to spend Lent without of the darkness. I guarantee it, you will not be disappointed. The next book that I published is called In Our Lady's Shadow, The Spirituality of Praying for Priests. And I had been asked by several ladies about my spirituality of praying for priests, my life had been offered for priests and how I prayed. And as I started to pray about it, very quickly within a few weeks, our Lord and our lady really showed me um, our lady's relationship with Jesus as the eternal high priest, all the way from his infancy up through his glorification in heaven. And it's, that's the foundation of our prayer for priests. We really need to go deep into um, how Our Lady related to him and then how Our Lady re related to the apostles and the disciples and, and how she relates to priests in order for us to be able to help and pray effectively for them, to be friends to them. Um, because priests need good, healthy friendships as well. Um, and it goes through the example of the saints who have done this because the saints have done it phenomenally. You know, they were spiritual mothers to priests and they were um, spiritual directors to priests and they were just spiritual friends to priests, like sisters. And um, God wants us all to be like brothers and sisters holding up the hearts of these men who dedicate their lives to bringing us the sacraments and spreading the gospel. Um, and the second part of this book, I included long excerpts from Pope Benedict the Sixteenth's document on spiritual maternity of priests. And um, I think what he wrote in that papal document is more beautiful than anything I can say. He goes through concrete examples of, you know, Therese of Lisieux and um, Blessed Conchita from Mexico and Bertha Petit and all sorts of different people who offered their lives either for one priest or for many priests or for vocations and, and miraculous stories. And it's really inspiring. So this book is um, an incredible gift to all those who pray for priests. But I would also say it's an incredible gift um, to priests themselves. Because by reading this, they enter into that relationship with Our Lady that Christ had. If they're called to be in persona Christi, in the image of Christ, then they're called to have that deep relationship with Our Lady that he did. And they can only do that by meditating on it and looking at it from the perspective that I wrote in here. Um, there's really no other book I've ever read, even by the saints, that has this kind of perspective. I think it's something the Holy Spirit gave me for this time. 
Um, and, um, and it draws too from some papal documents and things that are helpful, but it's more, you know, spiritual reflections on that. And then a priest can benefit greatly by reading, you know, those excerpts of Pope Benedict's um, document on the spiritual maternity of priests. A priest has to be humble enough to accept spiritual maternity and spiritual friendship with other people who God has brought to them to uphold them and to share in that intimate part of their life. I mean, it's hard and, it, you know, for um, especially a man to share, you know, things about their spiritual life with someone else. And yet it's only those who are humble who are able to do that with not everybody, but the souls that God brings to them who've been specially prepared for that. And you have to be careful that, you know, your relationships come from God, dwell in God, and point to God. But when they do that, there's nothing to be afraid of because the Lord can um, really build up the church in that way. You know, you look at St. Clair and St. Francis, you look at Benedict and Scholastica and Martin de Porras and Rose of Lima and Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross and even Therese of Lisieux. Um, there's so many examples of good and holy friendship and priests need that. And so I think that that document kind of can inspire them to know that they're not alone and can help them grow in their reception of the gifts that God wants to give them because we're all part of the body of Christ. And just like, I need a priest to give me the sacraments and I need a priest to direct me at times. Priests need the spiritual support of others and that includes women at times. Um, and like I said, not everyone, but when the Lord brings you that special friendship, then you can have the peace of you know, receiving that gift um, if you are leaning on the heart of Our Lady and the way that she related to Jesus and the apostles, right? So this book is really beautiful. And it also, um, you know, encourages, there's some very practical ideas about how to pray for priests, what to offer for them. And um, it spread greatly in Africa and in Pakistan. And we started to form these little prayer groups that we called Children of the Cross that were prayer groups of children dedicated to praying for priests on the first Friday of the month. And um, it's very simple um, because children are simple, but it's very important for the holiness of priests. Um, yes, to have adults praying for them, but I would say even more to have children praying for them. And these prayer groups really took off in the Middle East and we added the intention of persecuted Christians to the prayer groups in addition to priests because um, both issues definitely needed um, the prayer of children, the courageous and heartfelt trusting prayer of children. Um, so these books have been powerful in that way. And then I went on, you'll see, to write a book on these the apostolate specifically. But, um, you know, if you or a family member of a priest, a friend of a priest, someone who prays for them, or a priest yourself, you would greatly benefit from this book, In Our Lady's Shadow, The Spirituality of Praying for Priests. And the next book that I wrote is A Heart Frozen in the Wilderness, The Reflections of a Siberian Missionary. And here you see the art work I had done of um, the Holy family, family in a Siberian forest. And there's all sorts of meanings to this artwork. And you can get copies of any of these icons on my artist shop page. Um, it's maryklaskafiat.threadless.com. It's a, it, the website is called Threadless. And all of my art is up there. There's almost a hundred icons. But if you just wanted a picture and a copy of this to hang on your wall, or um, sometimes I know people like to get pillows so they can sleep on an image of Christ, right? Or a mug or a journal to go with the book. Um, you can do that. But this icon is very unique. And um, I actually have the original there, but I'm afraid I can't reach it. Um, but if you look at it, you have Jesus coming as a shoot. Um, 
I was thinking of the stump of Jesse and he has some green on him, the same color as the green of St. Joseph's cloak and that symbolizes his humanity. And Joseph has purple roses, which is the hidden sufferings that he endured for Christ. And then you have Our Lady with the yellow, which is like the Holy Spirit overshadowing her and the red flowers, which is her suffering, which is a little more visible. And Jesus is surrounded by both the yellow, the Holy Spirit, the divinity, and the humanity, the, the, red, the green. And he's surrounded by the hitting sufferings and the bright red sufferings because he and his little hands are pierced already because he comes as the infant crucified Christ. And he comes to suffer to save us. And that should um, endear us to him all the more. To see someone suffer um, opens your heart, but to see a child suffer, you know, opens your heart to them all the more. And if a suffering child is giving you a gift, you're more likely to receive it. Um, and so that's why Jesus comes as a child who suffers so that we don't fear him. So we let his wounded hands touch our broken hearts. And this book has to do with missionary work in Russia. And the first time I went was in 1994, it was around Moscow. And then later I lived in Eastern Siberia from 2001 to 2003. And then I went back every year for a month until about 2007 or 2008. And um, it is a conglomeration of, of emails I sent home kind of and explaining what the mission there was. But then I also go into the message of Fatima because it was in Fatima that Our Lady asked the children, Lucia and Francesco and Jacinta, to pray for the conversion of Russia. And they didn't know what that was, that Russia was a country. They thought it was a person. And they were told that Russia would spread her errors throughout the world, but that if we prayed really hard, she'd be converted. And at the end of that conversion of Russia would be the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. We have here Our Lady of Fatima that I put here to remind us of that message. So this book is both really interesting to read the stories of the mission in Russia. Anybody who's ever read Walter Chizik's book, With God in Russia, or He Leadeth Me, would really like this. And I have a lot of pictures, and I served in the same places that he did in Krasnoyarsk and in Siberia. We had missionaries up in Norilsk, where he was. Um, um, an Abakan, I think he was down in Abakan where we would go. And um, it's just interesting as a mission light. But then in light of the Fatima message and the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, it really can inspire prayer for the conversion of Russia and the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. And um, the book kind of surprisingly took off in Africa and the Middle East. And I didn't expect it to have the effect that it did, but um, they said that they found their persecuted situation in these pages. The suffering that the people endured under communism um, was something that they related to as Christians persecuted by the Muslims. And that darkness, that hopelessness, and they said that the light and the joy and the peace of Christ, the miracles that I talked about, um, that I found in the midst of that dark land, right? A heart frozen in the wilderness that needed to be warmed by the love of God. The love of God that comes from the heart of a missionary and from the Eucharist, the sacraments. Um, that set them on fire. And it set them on fire with hope for their own bleak situations. And then also to go be missionaries. And never before in the Middle East, you know, usually Christians would cower in a corner and just endure. Never before was there a missionary fire set, like the, I'm getting reports that this book is setting. And there were people that went to like poor areas or Muslim areas of their country and tried to really serve those people. And it was all inspired by this book. So um, this is a book that I have really shared a lot with teenagers that think it's interesting. And I was like a teenager the first time I went to Russia. I was 17. So, um, you know, I can relate to them. My one niece said, you were my age when you were doing this, you know. Um, but I really encourage, you know, for you to get this if you haven't read it and to read it and to spread it to the young people and to start praying regularly for the conversion of Russia. 
Um, and this one is not yet in Spanish or Polish. And then I had to quickly publish this book, Mornings with Mary, a rosary prayer book. And it's an icon I had made of Our Lady holding the infant Christ in a desert. But I thought it was perfect when I called it Mornings with Mary because the sun is rising in the desert, right? And um, I had started a, a year earlier a Facebook rosary every morning. So people like to pray in the morning with me. And someone had picked up that rosary and started putting it on YouTube and called it Mornings with Mary, kind of with Mary Klaska, but I consider it Mornings with Our Lady because we were praying the rosary. But I wanted these rosaries. There's so many people who pray the rosary and I have all of my special prayers that I do every day. And I wanted to share that with the world. And to get people back to the basics um, of the church and the church in her wisdom, each day of the week gives us a special devotion that we're supposed to practice. So I started including that in my morning rosary. So on Mondays, we pr it's consecrated to the Holy Spirit and we pray to the Holy Spirit. We do the litany and a consecration of our lives to the Holy Spirit and some extra prayers. And then Tuesday is to the angels. So we always do a consecration to the angels and to St. Michael and some other prayers, litanies to the angels. Um, Wednesday is traditionally for St. Joseph, so the same thing. Um, Thursday is for the priesthood and the blessed sacrament. So we pray extra special prayers for priests and in honor of the blessed sacrament. And Fridays is known um, as dedicated to the passion of Christ, his sacred heart and his precious blood. So we honor him in that way. We pray litanies to him under those devotions and consecrations to his sacred heart and precious blood. And then Saturdays, of course, is to Our Lady. And we do the consecration and the litany. And when I'm not working, I like to do the chaplet of Our Lady of Sorrows after the rosary. Um, and this we offer for priests because it was on Holy Saturday that Our Lady suffered as Our Lady of Sorrows. And so we honor her under that title on every Saturday, um, remembering the suffering she endured for us and to keep faith alive in the hearts of um, people on earth, you know, during the passion and death of Christ. And um, so that's what we do on Saturdays. And then on Sundays, I just have a beautiful litany of the Holy Name. So we honor the Holy Name of Christ, we pray that. And then there's all sorts of extra prayers that from time to time I'll, you know, throw in there on the Feast of the Miraculous Medal, we'll pray that prayer. And, the, you know, sometimes when there's a great need for conversion, we'll pray a prayer I have to St. Augustine and St. Monica and Our Lady of Consolation. Um, there's all sorts of different prayers. And so I put them together in a book because after a year, Facebook really started cutting me and blocking my rosary from people. And for a good six months, I had probably 80 to 90,000 people praying with me every day. Um, and they just can't find me anymore. When I go live, you know, five, 600 people will join me sometimes. And then I watch Facebook cut them off by a hundred. And I have people write to me all the time. I used to find you, I can't find you, you're blocked. So I thought, I didn't know what the future had in store, but I thought people don't have to pray live with me to pray these prayers. We can be united just in prayer. So I put together this book, um, Mornings with Mary, a rosary prayer book. And, um, you know, God used it in ways that I never um, dreamed because right away in Pakistan, they wanted it and they wanted to use it in those prayer groups. And they didn't have these prayers in order to so like, this is the first time that the Hail Holy Queen is being prayed in Pakistan by the simple people or the St. Michael prayer, you know, it has never been prayed in Urdu before. The one written by Pope Leo. Imagine the power of the grace coming from that in the spiritual battle in the Middle East. Never before has this happened. And so this, I would say, is probably the most important book, even though None of it's really attributed to me. I just collected it because this causes people to pray and prayer changes hearts. Prayer changes the spiritual world that we don't always see with angels and demons and things. 
So if, if you don't have this, get it. It is a very important book to have in every Catholic home, in every adoration chapel, um, in every mission, to have sitting there. Because if somebody wants to pray, all they have to do is flip it open and they will find a prayer that can lead them, right? Very powerfully. And then the last book that I wrote here, um, Raising Children of the Cross, The Spiritual Formation of Children. And this is just maybe one of my very favorites. Um, it goes through first baby Jesus and devotions to him and reflections on his life. And then the Maria Bambina, you see here my statue of the infant Mary and the graces that come from her in her childhood, right? Um, and then it goes through scriptures that talk about children and holy children in scriptures. I go through all sorts of canonized saints who were children and um, show how, yes, children are called to sanctity. Children are called to um, be an example for us so that we can become like children to enter the kingdom of heaven, right, is what Jesus said. But also to show that, like, you can't say, like, I'm not that great. Like, children are the simplest of all. And there are many examples of canonized saints who are children. And then um, after these examples and kind of reflections of <clears throat> holiness in childhood, um, I go through with the spiritual formation of children and talk about catechesis and spiritual direction of children teaching them virtues, setting spiritual goals, teaching them to be like a hermit, right? I had children that would say to me, I want to be a hermit like you when I was a hermit. And children are not called to live that the way I was with the vows. But I saw that what that was in their heart was a hunger for um, a contemplative life of prayer, of some sort of silence and some sort of solitude with God in prayer. And teaching, like fasting, a child is growing. They really shouldn't go without food. But a child can learn that spirit of sacrifice, of giving up something that they love so that another can be happy. Um, that's something that you teach in childhood. Um, and the same, like poverty, right? Like not always being gimme, 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 but, but sharing and having that simple lifestyle so that others can have what they need. Um, chastity, teaching purity to children in this corrupt world, obedience, which is so important, and the life of prayer, um, listening to God, teaching children to discern his will. There's all sorts of things. And so I cover it all in here, the spiritual formation of children. And then um, the last chapter, I talk about that apostolate of the children of the cross and what it means to join it and, you know, these little prayer groups and, um, how to do that so that even if people don't know me personally or someday after I die, they pick up this book, they read it, they're inspired, they want to start a Children of the Cross prayer group, then it's right in here. It just tells them how to gather children who are really a powerful spiritual force um, to pray for priests, to pray for persecuted children or persecuted Christians and to pray for the whole world. And at the very beginning of this book, it's so beautiful, I include a great quote from Pope John Paul II's letter to children. And in his letter to children, he says, here I come to an important point in this letter. At the end of this year of the family, dear young friends, it's to your prayers that I want to entrust the problems of your own families and of all the families of the world. And not only this, I also have other intentions to ask you, the children of the world, to pray for. The Pope counts very much on your prayers. We must pray together and pray hard that humanity, made up of billions of human beings, may become more and more the family of God and able to live in peace. I decided to ask you, dear boys and girls, to take upon yourselves the duty of praying for peace. Imagine that, a Pope that entrusts the most painful, difficult, and sorrowful situations in the world to the prayer of children. So isn't that just incredible? And then I hold up as an example for children um, from 
St. Louis de Montfort's um, Letters to the Friends of the Cross. And he talks about how Christians who are truly friends of the cross have to walk that narrow road. It's not going to be easy. And that's what it is for children who follow the cross as well. Um, he inspires us saying that if you are in our Savior's group, the, the group of people who follow Jesus' bloody footsteps, you're scaling a narrow path made all the narrower by the world's corruption. And our kind master is in the lead, barefooted, thorn-crowned, robed in his blood, and weighted with a heavy cross. Oopsie. There is only a handful of people who follow him, but they're the bravest of the brave. And in this book, we are trying to form that brave, bravest of the brave among our children. You know, they say the hand that rocks the cradle forms the world. And so, you know, this is a book that I very much try to live in my work as a nanny, right? If we can affect the lives of children, then we can affect the future of the entire world. So that is the sixth book that I have here. So if you're interested, you can look on Amazon to get any of these or all of them. We have, again, The Holiness of Womanhood, Out of the Darkness on the Interior Suffering of Christ, In Our Lady's Shadow, The Spirituality of Praying for Priests. I've got that beautiful icon of Jesus, the Eternal High Priest. You can go to my art shop, artist shop page and get a copy of that. And put that in a special place in your home. And every time you look at this icon of Jesus, the eternal high priest, you pray for priests. Um, a heart frozen in the wilderness. The reflections of a Siberian missionary. Mornings with Mary, a rosary prayer group book. And raising children of the cross. The spiritual formation of children. So that is my gift to the world. And it's in writing but it's also in the art, all right? And it's in things like this, a podcast that describes it all. And these are seeds that are really changing, especially the Middle East, North Africa, and we have such a need to get them into Central America. I need thousands and thousands of dollars right now. And it is such a heavy cross because when people don't do donate, I have to take on second and third jobs and then I don't sleep and then I get sick. But I can't say no to these needy people who want the gospel, and that's all that I'm giving them in this. So I ask you to be generous, and if you um, have it in your heart to contribute either a large amount or a small amount, you can just send it to me um, on PayPal. You can find my name under PayPal, Mary Klaska. Um, I have a Venmo you can use. There are the GoFundMe pages, and... Um, from time to time, I do Facebook fundraisers because sometimes that gets different people. So please pray for this. Pray that I find big donors or I like win the lottery so that I can help all of these hungry and thirsting souls who want to learn about their dignity, that want to learn about the cross and prayer and um, raising their children in a holy way. So thank you so much for being with me this week. And um, if you want to become a week, a monthly Patreon donor, that's another way you really help in this mission. Um, you can go to Patreon and it's Mary Klaska um, and sign up to be a monthly donor. At the end of this podcast, it'll, be a, it'll come up on um, the screen where you can go as a link to sign up and it helps me to know that every month I have a certain number of people that are committed to helping. So little by little, all of these little mustard seeds, whether it be books or prayers or dollars, they all are going 100% towards spreading the gospel directly among the poorest of the poor. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end, amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia.